now. Okay, cool. Good. All right. So yeah, I think if you have a question you want to shout out, go ahead and do it. So Dr. Thomas and I spoke last week. So what I'm going to talk about is the idea primarily of looking at the biosphere, the, the planet itself, and that Earth has remarkable characteristics. You've probably heard these kinds of things before, but in relation to every other planet. And so the biosphere, I, here's a definition. Biosphere Earth is the planetary scale platform, the entire planetary system, uh, which creates the possibility for and which sustains material life, meaning the actual physical matter of, of biological organisms, which obviously we are and, and pretty much everything we care about is. And Biosphere Earth has resulted in human life and the human economy. Most of our concept of um, where we are and what we do about it is through economic means. And it turns out that this system that is unbelievably old is the most important priority and it has the greatest capacity to reduce the crises that we all face today right now. Um, Biosphere Earth is created and composed by the continuously creative interface of oceans, atmosphere, freshwater, landscape, and subterranean micro to macro organisms. So we're talking about um, science so far that shows that microorganisms below the sea floor go down uh, maybe as far as 50 miles into bedrock. And we've um, captured microorganisms in the atmosphere as high as the atmosphere goes, you know, miles into the sky, as it were. Effectively, anywhere there's moisture, there can be microbiology. What's incredible is that as far as we've gotten with space exploration, over 4,200 planets have been identified. We haven't found a single microorganism anywhere else in the universe. Um, not on the moon, et cetera. So Earth has this interface of micro to macro organisms that is from below ground all the way to high in the sky. And it's the flows and the interactions of these conscious organisms. You know, every organism wants to survive. It has a consciousness that at least tells it what to do, how to adopt to seasonal changes. So the flows and interactions of self-conscious organisms create the materials, the services, such as oxygen production, uh, and the contexts which define the biological infrastructure that underpins humanity and the human economy. Okay, and then the things that make all that up are called biodiversity. That's microorganisms, that's plants, that's animals, that's insects, that's every life form that you can think of. Trees are part of biodiversity, as are uh, blue whales, as are you and I. Okay, so biointegrity is the name of my project, and the idea here is that we are trying to advocate for the um, biological integrity of planet Earth and restoring it. It's been radically reduced in the last few decades, literally in my lifetime. I'll be 50 next year. So since about 1970, uh, population on Earth has doubled from less than 4 billion to now nearly 8 billion. So then there's just been this radical increase in population that's driving all these things that um, we want to stop and reverse. Okay, so biointegrity then, the project began with talking about tropical forests, and I'm going to weave that in to what we're talking about today. So first of all, there's a bunch of talk, especially on Reddit and places like that, that, you know, we're going to be fine um, because we have brilliant super minds and supercomputers, and we can just go to another planet and start another biosphere. And, um, you know, Mars, among other things, um, it's eight, about 80 degrees below Fahrenheit, it's average temperature. So it is, it's frozen. It also, um, as I mentioned, there, we haven't found a single microbe on Mars. We've been investigating it now for nearly 50 years. Um, there is absolutely no life on this planet. And when you look at how Earth compares to Mars, um, Earth has at least a four billion year head start. The, the history of life as we know it so far again, for the entire universe, is on planet Earth. And that's about 4 billion years of development. So Mars uh, might have had some life three that ended around 3 billion years ago. You know, the idea of going to Mars to live inside boxes, I have a lot of, we all have friends that are freaking out because of the quarantine. And you still get to go to the grocery store. You still get to walk outdoors. You know, there's a lot of things about the quarantine that are way better than life on Mars would be once we finally get there, we'll be underground in capsules or something, and every step of the way you'll be threatened. So a biblical analogy would be that Earth is like Eden, 
relative to Mars, and Mars is just a frozen wasteland of absolutely no life at all. So here is what the biosphere means in uh, sort of physical terms. It took about 4 billion years to get to this point of what we have now. But what we have now is an interface between um, oceans and freshwater systems and lands and atmosphere. And the oceans primarily evaporate and send moisture over the lands. And what that does is feed life cycles. And the life cycles are most concentrated in forests. Um, forests have the greatest density of biodiversity. They have the greatest density of carbon. They have the greatest density of um, services that, of things they produced. And this cycling of life, of course, is present in every piece of the ecosystem of Earth from in the aquatic environment where life just stays there, um, as well as in the place, places where the aquatic environment joins to the land, as well as just in the grasslands and the other low vegetation environments, including deserts, and the interface between the grasslands and the forests. All of these things, they interlock and create basically an infinity loop of net positive benefits for humanity. And it's this cycling, this process of moisture moving and life continuing its, its, you know, its uh, journey, each, each individual organism's journey that has created the possibility for human beings. This is how the ecosystem has literally been built over hundreds of millions of years and billions of years. These yellow dots, I believe, are landing places of, of uh, exploration missions. They're insignificant to the point of this slide. So if you look on the right, you'll see Biosphere Earth animated and how it functions. This is 20 years of weather and um, carbon absorption compressed into a loop. This is a NASA slide that came out a few years ago. And so you see the ice retreating and so forth. Meanwhile, on Mars, I mean, basically nothing is happening. It's, it's dust, planetary scale dust storms uh, several times a year. Um, it has about 14% of the water it would need to create a biosphere because there's no life in the soils. The only carbon you can find is in rock and there's theoretically, there's not enough carbon to uh, foster life there. So, you know, this is one of my frustrations, obviously, with where we sort of are culturally, that we are talking um, about making Mars into Earth. Meanwhile, we're making Earth into Mars. So how did we get to biosphere Earth and how did we get to humanity is a pretty simple picture that um, planet Earth currently is believed to be somewhere in the range of four and a half to five billion years old. So a, a consensus estimate is that microbial life began around four billion years ago on Earth and life remained microbial for over 3 billion years. Then about 600 million years ago, you see the green um, box there. That's when complex life began. That's when what we know of as biodiversity, what we think of, that's the things we can see. You can think of micro life as simple life and you can think of complex life as macro life. And the macro scale life began about 600 million years ago and started creating ecosystems. Then it was uh, just 65 million years ago that our biosphere began to emerge. So it's after the dinosaurs went extinct and things started over within, it's now believed a few hundred thousand years. Uh, and then humanity, us, literally us people, didn't even show up until about 300,000 years ago. Our relatives are a few million years old, but the Cro-Magnon or the Homo sapien uh, individual goes back about 300,000 years. So what this looks like in terms of um, the balancing of it or the architecture of it is that the overwhelming majority of life on earth is microbial. And we'll talk about that again in one second. But on top of that then are the vegetated ecosystems and the animals of which we are one. What they are all doing again is cycling life. Everything wants to live. Everything wants to live to the best of its ability and everything will adjust to challenges to try to get back to living to the best of its ability but the system is going micro to macro to micro to macro. And so that basically looks like this. That you've got micro life that is both of the nutritional provider for vegetation, um, as well as the decomposer for all material life. And so things are just cycling around and around among these systems. And it's this cycling of life that created biosphere earth. From micro to macro, and macro to micro and on and on and on. Um, okay, today being uh, Indigenous Peoples Day, you can't really overemphasize the importance of Indigenous people relative to Biosphere Earth. 
You also can't overemphasize the importance of the issues facing indigenous people still today. We'll come back to that in a second. What I wanna just show you is this one beautiful idea that's a Native American idea that um, the universe is the circle of circles. So I, this is a you know, worldview, a, a philosophical or religious worldview. The biosphere is as well, the biosphere is a cycle of cycles. We'll come back to this. So these life cycles, they're cycling life and with life is moisture. So for instance, um, a forest or a garden with leaves, uh, leaves has a lot of surface area to capture moisture and evapotranspire transpire that moisture, circulate that moisture. And so what this looks like back to the actual planet Earth, so you see all these interlocking life cycles here and you remember that the moisture moves from the oceans over the lands. Um, but then when it rains, the moisture cycle actually functions like this. The you know, water goes down, it gets captured into the system. The richer the system, the more um, robust the system, the longer it can contain and cycle that moisture. Think of it as an economy and it's exchanging, you know, nutrition and moisture for life at, from micro to macro scale. Uh, and then um, some of that moisture will go up, up and away and go on to the next land-based ecosystem through the miracle of high pressure and low pressure in the atmosphere and so forth. And eventually it comes back around. It's just cycling around the whole planet in this, in this manner from oceans to lands and back again. And the reason you care about this is because all these things are what's creating our drinking water. In the United States, uh, more than half of the drinking water comes out of forests and, and off mountaintops. It's not coming out of plumbing or aquifers. As we continue to drain aquifers, we'll be more and more reliant on rainwater collection. This moisture evapotranspiration process, this process of holding moistures in vegetated ecosystems and cycling moisture through the air at micro to, to local scale is what really determines temperature in the way that you feel it. And so the more vegetation we have, the better control we have over maintaining a temperate temperature. You've probably heard of microclimate. This is the idea of microclimate. The next major thing it does is provide habitat for species these ecosystems and those species again are generating all of these other things it's their the interaction of the biodiversity the next huge thing is the carbon so when we talk about solving climate change generally what we're talking about is reducing carbon emissions from the atmosphere the thing that will reduce carbon emissions and keep it out of the atmosphere whether it comes from burning down a forest or from burning coal or from a you know gasoline car any number any type of emission Vegetation, particularly soils and trees, can pull in carbon the fastest and lock it in, and then it circulates in the biological economy. So it takes what is a destructive practice and turns it into a biological asset. And last but not least, that biological asset is powering our life support system. All of these things of oxygen production, the moisture circulation itself, the freshwater filtration, food production, that's all ecosystem dependent. That's all biosphere dependent. This is what all of this looks like at global scale. You saw this a minute ago in that little comparison of brown Mars to blue green earth. Um, so you can, I think the main thing I just wanna share while you're watching these movements happen, again, this is seasonal movement throughout the year, uh, two things. One is look at the, the center, look at South America and Central Africa. These are forest systems. Notice that they're green year round, whereas up in the United States, we have the ice descend, the green goes to white in most of the country. It's warm and wet year round at the equator. That means that the forest system, the grassland system, the systems of the tropics are productive year round. That makes them the most important asset for uh, carbon reduction and for biospheric services and, and stabilization of the biosphere. It's actually after the dinosaur extinction, um, life began again through tropical forests. They can't be overemphasized for their importance. I call them vital organ ecosystems or the biological core of our planet. Um, okay, back to Indigenous Peoples Day. <clears throat> so, um, the most important thing about Indigenous Peoples Day, this is you know some issues I just wanna share with you. I'm not really gonna very deep on what's going on in the Indigenous world, but I just wanna highlight the, the main issues that I'm aware of. So the most important thing is you know, Columbus got here 500 years ago, 
and it, we're, they are still fighting to survive, these people. The, those that haven't been annihilated in America and around the world, they're under attack right now. There was an article yesterday in the Huffington Post that said since around 2010, 500 indigenous American women in the United States have been, uh, have gone, have disappeared or been murdered and th there's been nothing done. And so this is, this is a crisis even greater than we can imagine. What we learn from indigenous people is how to have a relationship with the biosphere. They show us what stewardship really means. It's not through technology. It's certainly not through the Western European colonization model, which doesn't value the biosphere. Uh, rights and reparations are an enormous priority for the future of indigenous people. Their land, many indigenous communities that still are on their native lands need rights. And obviously in the United States, there's, you know, there's been this horrible tragedy of how we got here in terms of the US of A being, being built on top of the destruction of the Native American economy that was here. Uh, and we need to deal with these things. There's a lot to learn beyond just stewardship uh, that can enrich our lives and the quality of our humanity. I think, you know, probably most of us would agree we're in a, a nadir right now. We have to find ways to be better than we are right now. And, and one way is to learn from other cultures. Um, also, particularly in the tropics, the indigenous peoples possess enormous, um, an enormous wealth of medicines, an enormous wealth of, of a different medicinal philosophy, and other resources that can literally cure just about anything from um, emotional and mental disorders to PMS to cuts and wounds to cancers even. Um, and I, I won't go on about that. There's a lot more to say about that, but there's some of that in my other presentations you can check out. And then their identities, you know, obviously are threatened if they're uh, still fighting to survive. Their communities are still threatened and their opportunity is like, who's looking out for indigenous people, right? And development is the thing that's encroaching. It's the continuation of this Western European model of colonization that is modernizing everything it can get to and in the process destroying the life support system of the planet as we protect and restore the life support system of the planet, we rely on indigenous people. And so there is a, a model um, for community-based development where the partnership is very much about the well-being of the community's identity, um, their ability to choose what they bring in, the profits from whatever development is done going to the community instead of to JP Morgan Chase or something like that. Um, and all of these things I wish we had more time to get into um, and I need to know a lot more about and I think we all, we all do. So what are we learning from indigenous people? Again, primarily we're learning this thing that we forgot, that um, we rely on other living things. These are mud people in uh, Papua New Guinea. And so these guys, you know, they look really cool. Uh, they've also never forgotten, just like this woman in Indonesia, that they are directly related to, directly dependent on the other living things in their ecosystem, in the biosphere. And this leads to the recognition that life is about relationships, especially when you think about the biosphere. Everything is relational. Um, we talk a lot about these ideas of cause and effect and these kind of mathematical um, approaches to thinking about the organic qualities of life. It, it's just simply that life is relationships. And if you have a hard time relating to that concept, I think the fastest way to get there is to look at another thing that Dr. Thomas and I were talking about last week, that you know, your pets, that there's intelligent and conscious non-human life everywhere. You can have a relationship with your cat. You can have a relationship with your pet fish. Um, all kinds of uh, creatures are everywhere. And you should pay attention to what they are doing because in general, whether it's a plant or a wild animal or an insect, like this little grasshopper on my wife's hand here, um, they're not there to hurt you they're actually kind of curious about you and prefer to have a nice relationship with you and they're scared of you, you know, for good reason. And so starting to pay attention to how they respond, to how other life forms respond to you um, and how they try to communicate with you is the fastest way to recognize the interrelational nature of existence itself uh, through the biosphere. And this manifests itself out into the whole system again. This is a picture from somewhere up in uh, North Austin. And you know, inside of this ecosystem are many insects and a few 
probably wild animals. Um, and these plants are interacting with you and they're interacting with the weather conditions they're given, what hap whatever happens with the building and so on and so forth around them. Again, all of those relationships are creating our life support services. They're filtering our water. They're protecting us from storms. They're ma maintaining microclimate. They're absorbing and holding carbon and putting it to use. And what this looks like in a very simple model is that people are in the middle of the biospheric system. And our, our beliefs, our culture and our society would be the thing that we sort of live inside of. That's inside of our economy. Our economy is fed by ecosystems, a number of ecosystems. And it's the, the totality of those ecosystems that creates the biosphere itself. And it, this, it's, it's just this simple. This is what created us, and this is what continues our ability to live. We can't go to another planet and find this. Um, again, over 4,200 planets have been surveyed, and, and so far we don't see indication of a, even a simple life biosphere on another planet, much less a complex life biosphere. And the biosphere is creating all of these things. So, all right, here's a break point. Um, another thing we talked about, Dr. Thomas and I, was emotional shutdown. What are the, what are the things you guys are concerned about, um, especially in relation to the environment, but not necessarily just the environment? Can you like shout out the ideas or the list? Drinkable water. Yeah. Desertification. Yep. Extinction of species. Yeah. Lack of biodiversity within our communities with predators and stuff being pushed out. Mm -hmm. um, human made um, industrial carbon emissions and um, from like consumer products. Awesome. I was gonna say soil erosion with our monoculture farm stuff. Yeah. Deforestation? Yeah, absolutely. Political Im implications of climate migration. How do you mean political implications? Like when you see uh, like um, the anti-immigrant rhetoric and so like climate change is going to decimate major areas where people live, people have to move. What are the people who already live there? How are they going to react to millions of people? Yeah, okay. Christina also points out displacement of underprivileged people. Okay, cool. One thing that's really exciting about 2020 and you know today is that I feel like I've gotten to do these presentations to Dr. Thomas's honors class multiple times now. This is the third or fourth presentation. Every year it's like the the IQ level of people on environmental issues it gets so much more sophisticated. It's really phenomenal and thrilling. And, you know, hats off to you guys. Hats off to Gen Y and Gen Z and the internet and all kinds of things. Like, this is good. So, okay, so what do we do? What do we do about all the stuff that is listed there? Um, drinkable water, desertification, extinction of species, lack of biodiversity, predator annihilation, carbon emissions, consumer products and waste, soil There's erosion. Hey, Chris, there's one more in the chat. Ocean acidification and the deaths of coral reefs. Yeah. So there is a really simple way forward that everybody can get involved in. And, and you can approach it from globally strategic perspective and a locally strategic perspective. And so I just want to share some of that with you. It's this idea of protecting all of the remaining old growth ecosystems, transforming the economy, transforming the bad actors into biospheric asset generators. So for instance, um, you guys are probably familiar, agriculture um, is really driving deforestation and driving um, sort of the worst of what's happening to the ecosystem. We need to transform the agricultural system so it's not net negative or suicidal, so that it's net positive and regenerative. And then we also need to restore ecosystems that have been uh, degraded or destroyed in the last, particularly again, in the last 50 years as populations just gone crazy with growth. And we need to do that on land and in water. Um, <clears throat> so what that basically looks like from a global perspective is the protection of all of these cycles, you know, all of this integrity that is making biosphere earth functional. And a cl the climate benefits of protecting these old growth ecosystems and restoring ecosystems and so forth 
is off the charts, especially relative to technological solutions, which are equally uh, um, the priority in society, but from the biospheric perspective, they only really give us one thing. They only really give us an emissions reduction. What we want is for the climate system to be restored and for the uh, integrity of the living things to be restored so that we can continue to um, have you know, beautiful, abundant lifestyles. So protecting an ecosystem or restoring an ecosystem um, gets to this enormous moisture value that was you know, shown here. Uh, carbon reduction values, I'm gonna show you in a minute. The species value of these ecosystems, obviously there, there is no way to help in species and protect species other than protecting their homes, protecting their habitats and restoring that continuity through quarterization. Um, the life support value we've talked about it took about a billion years for there to be oxygen on Earth, and that's from the first billion years of microorganisms. So the system that we have around us right now that seems permanent is part of a long-scale temporal cycle, and we can only maintain that by maintaining these ecosystems. Um, then there's this idea of climate reversal. You can't reverse global warming just by reducing emissions. You can slow it down. Theoretically, you can reverse global warming through massive revegetation of the planet, both in the oceans and the freshwater systems, as well as on land, because of these moisture circulation values and their effects on temperature, that the moisture circulation literally cools down the microclimate and maintains it at a more temperate temperature. Do we have the resources available in order to like, um, to revegetate these areas that have just gone desolate? We do, it, it goes pretty fast. The restoration process goes pretty fast. It takes a while to get established. So if you're, if you're trying to rebuild a forest, it'll be like watching a pot boil for about three and a half years. And then all of a sudden you turn around and it's like, wow, look at that thing. You know, the, this, this ecosystem is massively verdant now. It's massively productive. Um, and in terms of having enough seeds or having enough soil, um, <clears throat> yes, we have enough seeds and we can, we can crop and uh, rapidly increase um, the amount of plantings we do every year. There are trees that are going into the ground right now that aren't going in as well as they could. We can change that. As you change that, it encourages more things to grow back. And um, there is a lot of natural regrowth that can happen without any inputs from human beings that would happen quickly and in, and in the timeline we need things to happen. The resilience value of ecosystems is immeasurable. And one of the main reasons that forests are becoming important now to city managers and, and govern, governments uh, with stormwater protection, preventing flooding. There's also the uh, ability of an ecosystem re to recover faster from extreme weather, like a freeze or a drought when there's more life in the system. The deeper and more dense the system is and the more diverse the system is, the more biological resources it has to recover. And it can endure more than the Gobi Desert or some other place that doesn't have biological resources. Um, the economic value of these things is off the charts. I mean, are from timber and things we use to build with and obviously what we eat, but also from this bigger philosophical point that what we call human capital is created, fed, and sustained by the biosphere itself. So the stronger the biosphere, the stronger the economy. The cultural value of these places that ties more directly to indigenous people, but most of my friends, you know, love being outdoors. Um, it needs to be nice weather usually, but the engagement with other living things is a lot of what makes life meaningful. Um, and I mentioned the medicinal value. There's something like only 10% of the potential medicines in the Amazon have been tapped so far. And then I talk about next era value in other presentations, because the idea is that we need now to be building what will sustain the next era, what will make the next era um, as, as good and bright as it possibly can be. Our, our big question should be, how good can we make it? You know, society should be saying, how good can the future be? And so we need to be thinking about the next era. This era is coming to an end, and we can address it by bridging our way into a brighter, more uh, wild planet future, or we can see what happens. Um, but so, this is, um, this is just showing you that a lot of the priorities have been identified. The bottom map is showing the global tree restoration potential being something like a trillion trees 
the upper map is showing how ecosystems are protected and, and in various states with those protections. But we know basically what the ecosystems are. We know now what they can, what their capacities are. And uh, we can do a lot really quickly to prioritize where the most value is and help those systems first and benefit the whole planet that way. The carbon reduction value, these, um, these values I show here are loose values. The, for a variety of reasons I can answer if you like, but this is the general picture of how much carbon could be removed by protecting and rebuilding the biosphere. So the first uh, four there are showing that we're removing about 25% of global emissions every year just by letting the ecosystem stay wild that we have left. Um, then if we start to restore things, we can really increase that. There's the, the second category there of three, three things, forest regrowth, reforestation, and soil restoration. So forest regrowth and reforestation, that's from two different studies. Those are integrated in ways I'm not sure. But loosely speaking, around 45% of global greenhouse emissions could be reduced every year by aggressively rebuilding our biosphere. And in addition to that, we have things we can do in our cities and, and on, you know, between our cities. We can green up. There's enormous potential with seaweed and farming seaweed and moving that seaweed onto land to enrich our soils, also moving it and feeding it to cattle. It reduces their flatulence and reduces their greenhouse emissions and creates better quality beef. And then there's coastal restoration and the large species restoration, a, a, a blue whale, you know, there's something like, uh, you know, less than 10% of the blue whales on earth now that, than 100 years ago. If we were to restore them, they are also carbon sinks, just like forests. They store an enormous amount of carbon. Um, and so I put these 2% numbers up here as just a safe an estimate. But what we're looking at is a total reduction for, by rebuilding biosphere Earth of above 70% of greenhouse emissions if we could actualize all these things immediately. And the crisis that we're in is both biospheric destruction and global warming climate change. To address the global warming climate change aspect, we need a massive emissions reduction quickly that is compounding over the years. That is biosphere. Biosphere is extremely inexpensive to actualize. And as you saw on the previous uh, list of blue there, it's the most multifaceted systemic solution. And anyway, so moving forward here, it, potentially the sky is sort of the limit with urban greening and sea, seaweed farming, and uh, we need more studies on these things. So how do you address refugeeism and so on and so forth? Well, first and foremost, you make refugeeism less likely by rebuilding the natural resources of these places and doing community-based economic development that empowers people to have the shelter, the, the food, the, the plumbing, um, the security they need. The most important areas from the global perspective that need attention are the tropics. And if you're gonna do one thing, it would be protect tropical forests. This is the single most impactful global solution. So you can go to biointegrity.net slash solutions and see what we're recommending there now. This is what Dr. Thomas has been supporting over the years, is the most impactful solution to the climate crisis, the biosphere crisis, uh, alleviating the mounting pressures on refugeeism. Um, and it comes down to the fact that the tropical forest system is the most concentrated life support system on the planet. The, um, the biodiversity in the upper right-hand corner, this is showing land-based biodiversity. Um, and you can see it's concentrated in the Amazon, and across the tropical forest system. If you scan from the top right to the top left back and forth, you'll see that the green tropical forest system is basically where the biodiversity is. And if you look directly below that to the purple one, you see that the green tropical forest system in the upper left and the bottom right corner bioproductivity is where the most value is. The, the most functionality is coming out of the, the uh, tropical forest system. And then when you look at how fast can we absorb greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere, how quickly can we reduce the emissions that are coming from our power plants and our deforestation, it's through protecting and restoring tropical forests. This um, third map that's directly below the tropical forest on the bottom left corner shows you the rough rate of carbon acquisition, meaning it's pulling carbon out of the atmosphere like a, like a vacuum. It'll hold on to 100% of the carbon molecule and release uh, two thirds of the oxygen molecule. And so you get, we call it making oxygen, but what you're getting is it's actually splitting these uh, components into a structural uh, carbon 
and, and oxygen that we can breathe, you know, it's, it's just the best thing in the world for reducing emissions is um, forests in the tropics. And so this is that system. And one more big point on this, there's the third piece of this presentation. I don't think we're gonna have time for it, but it's more on tropical forests. But this is the big takeaway that what you see here is the moisture circulation at atmospheric scale. These forests are pulling the moisture towards them. They're circulating it around and they're moving it on. And as they do this, they're not only creating all these things you need, the temperature scale now goes to a global scale temperature impact. That moisture circulation of the tropics is a single best way to slow global warming. And we can address coral reefs in part by restoring tropical forests because they restore moist, uh, atmospheric circulation. Putting forests back increases atmospheric circulation. Putting them back at the tropics increases it where it matters most, both to the whole planet and to the coral reef system. It also grabs carbon the fastest, that reduces the acidity buildup in the oceans. Um, and those are the main points there. This, that's the global view in a nutshell. And then locally, and we'll sort of wrap up here, I think, a local strategy then is to rebuild the green infrastructure that used to be here. There is no such thing as the environment. There is only the biosphere and we live inside of it. And so we want to relink together the green infrastructure that used to be on our, on our planet. Um, you know, Earth is a wild planet. From our perspective, Earth is a wilderness planet that created the possibility for humanity and it's the wilderness that makes humanity and the human economy work. So at micro scale, this can be um, potted plants on your windowsill, any size bit of life. And then at the local scale, this is things like parks and uh, you know, segmented ecosystems that are refuges in various ways that could also be rooftops and things like that. Then we wanna see those things merge. We wanna make corridors between the larger ecosystems and ultimately we wanna protect the macro ecosystems, the, uh, Yellowstone and the Amazon, and we want to see macro ecosystem, macro wildernesses get as big as possible. So what we're trying to do is reconnect this green infrastructure, and you can play a role in it at local scale by bringing more life, more wildlife in particular, into your local environment. So I just want to show you the last little sequence here, how that looks. So from small spaces, outside your window, inside your house, to larger spaces, if you're lucky enough to have a yard or even a large yard, and let it go wild as much as you can. To cultivated yards, this is using things like permaculture to make the yard as, as wild and robust as possible, or to make it as productive as possible to grow food. And um, I like that she has an American flag, by the way. Um, to garden systems, you know, and, and what better thing for us to learn and teach our children then how to interact with the soil, how to grow food, how to understand moisture cycles, how to relate to the many, many species. Um, you see the kids in the upper right are holding up little, little birds. Um, it's just joyful, you know, this, this whole interaction with the real world, the biospheric world. Um, community spaces, this is a place in uh, East Austin and they had a uh, an easement they turned into a concert space, a chicken ch uh, tractor, and um, a garden, and then parks. And I was, when I was putting these slides together, I realized every kid basically has a big smile on their face in this photo, which if you've ever tried to take photos of children, it's like it's pretty hard to get everybody to smile at once. But there they are in the park, you know, having a good time. Um, and we need to take this idea and integrate it into the built world. We need wilderness functionality inside our cities, um, the places we live and work, all the way down to the rural environment. So that looks like the in-between spaces becoming greener. This one on the right is the High Line in New York City. Obviously there are medians all over the place that could be greener, better for pollinators and, and other species and carbon reduction. There's things like this that can help manage stormwater in, in cities and clean the water and send the water uh, to a places where you want it to go in a more biospheric um, manner. And permaculture, if you guys are interested in getting into this stuff and going far, permaculture, which means permanent agriculture, has the biggest toolbox of methods to design both for food production and just general landscape design and ecosystem design. 
then there's the idea of our buildings and rooftops. You know, there's so much that can be done with these just dead spaces on top of the buildings of the world. Uh, and these are vegetated walls in Austin. You guys probably know Bennu Coffee down at Riverside. I and mean, this is the parking garage over by Central Market um, on 45th Street. And that, you know, that parking garage, that just happened naturally. They didn't set out to put that wall there. And so this is one of the principles is that once you get it going, once it gets going, it will do the most it can to, uh, to live and thrive. Um, and that's the principle we should be managing rather than cutting it back because we don't like it. We should be managing its fluorescence. Um, and then these really cool things. This, this building is in, um, the, the main one you see here is in Bogota, uh, but it offsets the carbon footprint of every person that lives inside of it. Um, and it cleans the air, and it reduces local temperature, and it reduces particulate pollution from the traffic. And then the, ho the thing on the bottom left is a hotel in Singapore that is, again, integrating the, the idea of habitats. And the, the architect that did this does uh, skyscrapers, and he talks about migration habitats for birds of prey. And um, let's see if my cat doesn't derail the presentation here. I don't know if you guys can see him yet. Um, so there's a lot we can do, and, and we're just scratching the surface. And the big idea is to reconnect the wildernesses, reconnect the wild places. So this is a corridor system along the river. This is the big idea again, that we want to reconnect everything we can. And there's these beautiful things that are starting to happen in Europe in particular, where they're building migration corridors. You know, there's a ton of carbon in there. There's a ton of moisture in there. There's a ton of species that can continue to survive. And there, obviously, there'd be no way for large predators or anything else that's um, terrestrial uh, and legged to get from one side of that highway to the other, and they provide safe haven. Here's another one on the left, and then um, on the right is showing agroforestry, and agroforestry is the primary way to radically reduce the negatives of our food production at industrial scale and increase the security of our food production at industrial scale because of, again, the moisture benefits. Back to the climate conversation, there's a lot of talk about reforestation to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but the science says we should consider that a secondary benefit of the moisture and temperature benefits of reforestation, that we can reduce temperature and we can um, increase hydrological and um, moisture circulation stability and securitization through reforestation. And then we also, by the way, reduce greenhouse emissions super fast, get habitat, so on and so forth. And we want to see these corridors across whole states and from state to state, you know, all around the world. We're, we're not there now, but it is where we need to go. Okay, so reviewing really quickly, and this is the end of the presentation. Um, what you've sort of seen today is this idea of cycles of life being what's unique about Earth relative to all other planets, that it's integrated from below ground to the air, and it's integrated both through the organisms and the moisture. That the building of that system, the architecture of it, and the actual construction of it took billions of years, that we exist now based on life cycle systems that are several billion years old, 600 million years old, 65 million years old, and then our species arriving about 300,000 years ago, that the majority of life on Earth is microbial. And so if humanity continues to screw up and you know drives life off the planet, the microbial life will continue because there's so much of it and it's so ad adaptable. And this microbial life is interacting in these cycles of life with all the other levels of life. It's all, as we say, inter interdependent. You've, I'm sure, heard that before. But the idea of cycles of cycles, circles within circles, this is how it works. And this is what we get as a result from all of that cycling. Life is about relationships. The biosphere is about relationships. And our place in these relationships is in the middle of the biosphere, which is made up of ecosystems. The most powerful solution is to protect tropical forests. And meanwhile, you know, Good luck anywhere else but Earth. So back to the what I'm doing and all that, how you can get involved in the solutions today. If you want to make a difference at global scale, check out biointegrity.net slash solutions.